So, the, the plot to kill James I's father. He'd been married to Mary, Queen of Scots, alcoholic waster. Mary, Queen of Scots, was pregnant, but Lord Darnley strongly suspected that she was having an affair with her Dacian Italian secretary. He got drunk. He burst into the room where Lord Dar where where Mary Queen of Scots was with her Italian secretary, a man called Rizzio, got a loaded pistol and pointed the loaded pistol against his own wife's pregnant belly. So he's not a nice man. Mary Queen of Scots decides that she's going to have Lord Darnley killed. Lord Darnley is sleeping alone in a manor house upstairs. The plotters that were going to kill Lord Darnley break into the house, pack gunpowder in the base of the house and retire. Lord Darnley is woken up by the sound of someone breaking in, in there downstairs. He gets his, his, not, his bed sheets, knots them and starts to climb around down the outside of the house. The gunpowder explodes and Lord Darnley is sent spinning through the air to land safely, if a bit charred, in a bush. Lord Darnley's there thinking, wow, that's a lucky escape. I better go and get some help. Somebody's trying to kill me. He goes wandering down the road. Meanwhile, the plotters are there going, great, we've killed Lord Darnley. Mary, Queen of Scots is going to be very happy with us. Lord Darnley wanders down the road towards the nearest village to get help, sees some men in the distance, goes running to them, going, help, help, someone's trying to kill me. And he runs straight into the plotters, who are busy celebrating, having already killed him. They are a bit surprised to find the person that they've killed running to ask for their help, so they knife him and leave him dead in a ditch. And so James I, remembering that his father had been blown up once, does have reasons to suspect that about that gunpowder might be used to assassinate members of the royal family. But despite the fact that he's there going, oh, I think that there's going to be a plot with gunpowder, Cecil knew what the note meant. But he wanted the king to get the credit for deciphering the note. They wait a day. But the next day, the 2nd of November, the Privy Council resolve to search the Houses of Parliament. But they don't do it immediately. They wait till the 4th of November. Now, if I suspected there was gunpowder underneath my chair, I would not wait three days to search for it. But we'll come back to that later. On the 4th of November, Dig a man called Digby then is leading the hunting party near the king's daughter, ready to strike. Ready to grab the king's daughter and, you and set her up as the queen. Percy gave Guido Fawkes his pocket watch so that he could time the lighting of the fuse while Rookwood went to go and collect some specially, Rookwood remember was the great swordsman in the plot, the, the famous one, he had ordered from the royal armories some specially engraved swords for the uprising. If you're going to try and overthrow the government, do not ask the government armories to make you specially engraved swords for the plot. The man is a complete tool. But nonetheless, he goes and collects them. And the armories hand, happily hand over and go, yes, were well, they engraved for anything special? He's like, oh, no, no, no. Now, Cecil, Montague, Eagle and Winniard search the undercroft and there they find Guido Fawkes with a load of firewood underneath the Houses of Parliament. He claims to be John Johnson, storing it for his master, Thomas Percy. And the government go, oh, OK, in that case, that's fine. That night, however, the government come back, led by a man called Thomas Niviet. And they find Guido Fawkes there again, and this time they arrest him. The lantern that Guido Fawkes was going to use to light the fuse is kept in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And behind the firewood, they find 36 barrels of gunpowder. The plot is foiled. The other London plotters flee, except for Thomas Winter, who joined the crowd to watch what was going on, thinking, ah, the government's going to be looking for people running away. On the 6th of November, Guido Fawkes has still said nothing, not even his own name, and so the king authorises the torture of John Johnson, or Guido Fawkes. Now, the, fu the fugitives raid Warwick Castle for supplies, and then they went to Norbrook to collect weapons. They then went to Huddington, where Thomas Winter joins them. The plotters have received no support from the countryside. They then go to Holbeck House. There they discover that the gunpowder they've got for their weapons is wet. So the idiots get the gunpowder and they spread it out in front of the fire to dry out their gunpowder. Understandably, the gunpowder catches fire. It doesn't explode because gunpowder needs to be contained to explode, but it, it burns and it burns incredibly hot, spitting everywhere. And 
it does burn Catesby, Rookwood, Grant, and a member of the hunting party, Morgan. After this, most of the rebels are there thinking, what are we doing? And they leave. Only Catesby, the Wright brothers, Percy, Rookwood, and the now blinded Grant, blinded by the gunpowder, stay behind. On the 8th of November, the Sheriff of Worcestershire, a man called Richard Walsh, and 200 men attack the house. Catesby and Percy are killed by the same bullet that punches through one and catches the other. The Wright brothers are also killed and Rookwood injured. Rookwood, Grant, Morgan and Winter are arrested. Now over the next few days, all of the plotters, except for Francis Tresham, the one who may have sent the note, are arrested, as is, the, as is Northumberland, who has no idea about the plot, but he's arrested too. The persecution of Catholics is rapidly stepped up. Parliament are so relieved that the plot is foiled that Cecil persuades them to grant the king huge sums of money, extraordinary taxation of an incredibly high level, more than had ever been granted by the Parliament to Elizabeth I, except for the year just after the Spanish Armada. And so we're looking at the second biggest taxation in near a century, given to the government out of gratitude for the foiling of the plot. Only Fawkes is tortured, the rest rapidly confessed. Northumberland was fined the equivalent of £6.5 million in modern money, despite the fact that he had nothing to do with the plot, and had been, was then kept in the Tower of London until 1621. He would become known as the Wizard Earl, what a title, for his scientific achievements, because while he was locked in the Tower, he was pretty bored, and so he really took to science. He was the first person to observe sunspots, and he mapped the moon using a telescope months before Galileo did. But he hasn't gone down in history, despite the fact that it should be Northumberland, not Galileo, who gets the credit, because he was a political prisoner. Now, Catesby and the Percy's bodies were decapitated, and their heads were put on spikes outside the House of Lords to warn what happens to traitors. On the 12th of November, Francis Tresham is finally arrested, and he dies in the Tower of London, possibly poisoned, before he can be interrogated. On the 30th of January, 1606, Digby, Robert Winter, Grant and Bates are dragged behind horses backward, then hung, drawn and quartered. A truly horrible death. They hang you by the neck until you're just about to die. They cut you down. They then cut open your stomach. They take out some of your organs and burn them in front of you. They then cut off your private parts and put them in your mouth. They then finally get an axe and take off your head cut your body into four pieces, and they put the pieces on spikes around the country. A horrible death. Digby is the one who has this happen to him first. Uh, the next day they did the same to Thomas Winter, Rookwood, Keyes, and Fawkes. But Keyes tried to hang himself first. As they're putting the rope down, he tries to jump off and snap his neck. He failed, but Guido Fawkes thought that's a good idea, and he managed it and succeeded. In 1606, some very harsh anti-Catholic laws were passed although many senior Catholics continued to work for the government. Despite this, it has to be said, James's reign was relatively, for the time, relatively lenient compared to what would be the treatment of the Catholics for the next 200 years. Now, in our next video, we will look at could the plot possibly have succeeded, and then we'll look to see if it had been a government conspiracy.